So, well, welcome to another episode of Amazing Individuals, where we talk to individuals with intellectual disabilities and the people that support them. On today's episode, we will be talking to Special Olympics Chief Inspiration Officer and the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors and a fellow athlete, Loretta Claiborne. Loretta has numerous accomplishments, including being awarded the 1996 SB Arthur Ashe Award for Courage, being inducted into the Women in Sports Hall of Fame, and into the Special Olympics Pennsylvania Hall of Fame, and also having the honor of introducing President Clinton at the 1995 Special Olympics World Games. She has also been invited to the White House dinner celebration and recognized by Presidents Obama, G.W. Bush, Clinton, G.H. Bush, and Reagan. Hi, Loretta. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Well, thank you. Uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit about where you're from? I am from Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, in a little town called York, Pennsylvania. If you ever heard of York peppermint patty, the first York peppermint patties were not made in Hershey. They were made in York, Pennsylvania. Oh, see, that's an interesting fact. I think people, some people wouldn't know. So that's a cool thing to have known for your town. So um, how did you get involved with Special Olympics? I got involved in Special Olympics. I was going to, to a school to work program and I would go to school a week and go to work a week. and. One of the counselors there knew I was having a lot of problems. So he noticed that I would run back and forth instead of taking the bus, the local bus to the workshop on my work weeks. And after a hard day of almost getting in another fight, he called me to his office at the end of the day. And he introduced me to what he gave me a paper and I didn't know what it said. The only word I could read was Olympics and that was my introduction to Special Olympics. Well, that's me. Unfortunately, you know, like you said, I, I dealt with a lot of bullying myself, you know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I don't think, I mean, times have changed a little bit, but not that much with that. So, um, you know, and, but at least you found that escape from, you know, Special Olympics found, you know, have given you that escape. So, so um, out of all the sports you compete in, uh, what is your favorite? My favorite is running because all you have to do is have a pair of shoes and walk out your door. You don't need a basket. You don't need a swimming pool. You don't need any other equipment than to lift your leg a little bit higher or faster than walking or you can just jog. Mm -hmm. And that's basically like our, why I like running because it's an economical sport. It didn't cost a lot. I came from a poor family, so I didn't have the opportunity of playing basketball or swimming or anything like that. But also when I get mad now, instead of using my fists, I can go out and take a five mile run and just think things over. Oh, and I use it for many it. things. It's a great tool for thinking about what's going to happen at the board meeting. If I have some questions proposed to me, I use my running to think. Oh, that's great. Using... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, you know, I, I always, I, I, I'm a big proponent of nonviolence myself. So when I get upset, I just kind of like, I mean, I can't physically run, but I'll take walks or I'll walk away, you know, because to me, there's nothing, nothing gained by, you know, doing any kind of physical violence. So if anything, you make the matter worse. Yeah, you so, learn that when you're older, but when you're a young kid, that's hard to swallow. It's oh, exactly. To swallow. Exactly. Okay. Okay. You've been a, you have been part of Special Olympics since 1970. How has it changed through the years? Yes, I have been part since 1970 and where I live at and probably all over the country, there was probably no more than a couple sports. I would say athletics, what they used to call track and field. Now it's back to track and field, swimming and possibly like basketball or soccer. There were very few athletes when I started in 1970. And when I look at it today, there's people who don't have an intellectual disability competing on the same team with those who have an intellectual disability, such in our school programs, the unified sports. 
Uh, there are clubs and unified sports is all over the globe now. Special Olympics is in over 195 countries, I think almost 200 countries and almost 6 million athletes. Now with the pandemic, the numbers had one down, but just to see the whole thing of Special Olympics, it has changed so much. We have uh, our last World Games we had in Abu Dhabi, it was 40% women. Normally before that, it was 80% male and 20% female. So it's so many changes and the changes are for the better. They're more or less promoting inclusion, whether it's in schools or with, whether it's with our older athletes, leadership programs, athletes could serve on boards. And of course, like you, you're married. Our athletes start at the playing field with discipline and they look for new heights, new goals. And beyond the playing field, they get jobs. They look to marry. They look to do anything that anyone else can do if they're included with the right supports and the right people in, mm -hmm. in their circle. Most yeah. definitely. You've been, well, well, you, so you started in 1970 and how would you start? You started 79. in- 79. Yeah, so he's kind of been in the same kind of ballpark figure of how many years you, you guys have both been doing it. So yeah. I think you guys- about nine years ahead of him. Yeah. yeah. But I don't make it as a competition because it just, it, it just, you know, oh, like, right 71 now. 71, I started martial arts. So yeah, I but, but that I, too. But, um, you know, now, now that, you know, I'm turning 60 in May. So. Um, Congratulations. Thanks. And so right now I'm, um, I'm not doing certain sports anymore because too many injuries. So <laughs> right now much more to offer yeah yep. yeah so yeah so i'm giving back yeah so like when we go to Lord, like this when we go to germany it's like you know when i busy when, when i'm busy with the congress he's he's already said he's going to volunteer you know help out with world games so yep. you know he, that's his way of what giving back yeah so so and that's what he enjoys so um so you here we go you can do the part you had the honor uh, you have the honor of meeting the founders of Special Olympics, okay. Eunice Kennedy. Kennedy Shriver. Could you tell our listeners a little um, about your relationship with her? Yes, I could tell you a lot, but I'll <laughs> tell you a little. We became friends after a race in 1980. I was down in Washington, and this lady, I could see her walking around. And I remember the lady's face from 1972 when I ran out in Los Angeles in 1972. After my race, I was upset because somebody had made a mistake in the coaching. A girl cut in front of me and the coach didn't vouch for me to be able to go on to the next level. And people don't know this, but it used to be if you ran in your first race and you didn't make the top three, you didn't make it to the next level, to the final. You got an award, you got a ribbon, but you didn't have a chance to compete for the medal at the right. end. Right. And I never forget this lady come to my coach in 1972 and she kind of read my mind and she looked at me and she says, did you have a good day? Well, I had to say to her, yes, because my mom 3000 miles away had a couple of numbers and she was listening to see if I <laughs> act up or anything. And it was going to give it to me 3,000 miles away. So yep. and I remember this lady walking up to me and said, are you having a good day? And I said, yes, ma'am. She says, are you having fun? Yes, ma'am. A couple of short questions and that was it. In mm -hmm. 1981, 80, I was running in a race down in D.C. and I saw this lady. And she stood on the tractor and trailer truck and she starts speaking to the athletes about the Marine Corps Marathon and about the Special Olympics portion of the Marine Corps Marathon. We were running a 5K. And I looked and I said, I remember that lady. And that was it. I was focused on my run. So as they ran the different divisions, I had finished and this lady walks up to me and I looked at her and I said, to her, I said, hello. And she looked at me and she started talking and she asked me, would I be her friend? And of course, I wasn't used to having somebody asking me to be their friend mm -hmm. and then keeping in touch. Mm -hmm. 
but she gave me a little card. I wrote her a letter and I said, I, I don't write that well. I'm not that great. She says, oh, I can understand. I can understand, but I want you to write me. And so ever since that day, we have been friends. And I tell you, they say the best friend is not always the friend who agrees with you all the time, but one would, who would argue back with you. And that's how we were. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nice. What is, I guess, you know, with your friendship with her, what is one of your, if, one of your favorite memories or, you know, that you have of your friendship with her? Oh, I have so many memories, but I'll never forget the time she called me up and we had this thing. I'd gotten sick in 1996. And we had this thing that every Monday night <laughs> I would call her or she would call me. But I, I said, well, it's easier for me to call you because I had karate class and stuff like that. And one Monday night, I came home because I was a black belt. We had to take law enforcement courses. Mm -hmm. So they would always have one of the state police come in and talk to the martial artists, the black belts, the high rank, which I was one of them. And I remember that class was running late. And I was like, I had to really be home. I promised my friend I was going to call her. So finally the Sheehan, that the head teacher of the class gives me a ride home. I get home and I look and I say, oh, it's 10 o'clock. I don't call nobody at 10 o'clock. We have this rule in my family. You don't call nobody at 10 o'clock unless it's an emergency. So I decided not to call. So my phone rings and I pick up the phone and here's this woman, my friend. Well, you didn't call me. She was going on and on and on. Why didn't you call me? And I said, well, I was at a karate class and it ran late. Well, what are you doing now? And I made the mistake and said, nothing. <laughs> I had to actually pull the phone from my ear and let her go on. She says, well, I heard you're going to be at the office in a couple of weeks. I said, yes, I'm going to get on the Greyhound bus. I'll be there. I'll see you. So I went down to the office. I had a meeting. I went, went in the restroom, changed it into my khakis and my dress shirt and everything and then all of a sudden I go in this meeting and I'm just doing this and doing my hair is in place and I go into my meeting and I said well I'm going to get out of here I got a two o'clock Greyhound bus coming I'm going to cut across the way catch the metro and catch my bus well I came out that meeting and here was this woman my friend Eunice wow you're here and so <laughs> lobby was full of people having sessions. I guess a meeting had ended. She goes, well, where are you going? I said, well, I'm getting ready to. And she goes, don't give me no excuses. Don't tell me what you can't do. You show me what you can do. Don't tell me what you can't do. My son is having a campaign and I want you to stay. And I'm like, these are the only, before I can get it out of my mouth, she says, I don't want no excuses. And I end up staying there with her other son, helping her son run for Congress. I learned so much about voting. It made me appreciate voting more. Well, that's great. So that's a story I'll never forget. And I say that to people all the time. Don't tell me what you can't do. Show me what you can do. Exactly. Yeah, that's basically what yeah. she said when she fought for Special Olympics to make it what it is today. And if she was living today, I'm pretty sure she would be a darn good president. Mm -hmm. She would tell our society, don't tell me what you can't do. I want the society to show me what you can do because you can do if you put your effort to it. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I always get frustrated when people say, you know, you can't do this or when they're surprised, you know, that we're, you know, we do stuff. It's like, yeah, we're able to. We just maybe had to have the right support, but we're able to do almost, almost everything. Might, you guys might do it differently. It might won't be the, to your best, but to be to my best. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, go ahead. You also have the honor. Mm -hmm. You've also had the honor of having dinner at the White House and meeting different presidents. What was the experience like? And if you had to choose a favorite president that you met, who would it be? You know, I liked them all. I really liked Bush. I loved Obama and I loved Clinton. I liked them all. Yeah. And a lot of people think going to the White House, yes, if you're going to the White House and you're just going to have dinner and sit there and listen to the entertainment, it's easy. 
But for my portion of it, it doesn't happen that easy. Mm -hmm. I'm normally the one who's getting picked out of that crowd and has to get up there and deliver a message. It's going to be impacting not only to me, but to the people in that White House, in that audience, and convey it out to the world. So my job doesn't come easy. Exactly. I very rarely get a chance to go to the White House and sit there and just have dinner and have a grand time. It doesn't happen. <laughs> Oh, most definitely. Can be very stressful. Yeah. I can understand that. So, yeah. So, um, and to go along with it, what, so you're the chief inspirational officer for, you know, Special Olympics. What are some of the things you do in, in that role? In that role, there's a lot to do. Um, just like I was just telling you about the White House, uh, being on the board to make sure that the board stays, stays with the mission but also promoting Special Olympics in all aspects, not just in sport, not just in board meetings, but making Special Olympics be aware in every way, whether it's in schools, whether they're in, uh, they might call me up and say, hey, we need you to give us some advice on how to go to a certain level of inner city schools and how can we do that? So it's, it's, it's a constant job. Right now with COVID, it's not as much, but I've been on there's times I've been sitting at computers for hours. <laughs> but is it worth it? Yes, it is, because I know what Special Olympics has done for me and I know what it can do and hope and pray that it can do for so many others. Well, around we appreciate, the world, yeah, we, we appreciate all you do for us. I remember exactly. when we, you were talking at our uh, the recent uh, law enforcement kickoff conference and, you know, we could love law there, enforcement. We, yeah. And we couldn't be there, but you know we listened to it, and it was your it was, your words were so in, inspirational. So, yep. so, but go ahead. Okay. You speak uh, four different languages and are fluent in sign language. Could you tell our listeners what four languages you speak? You know, I really don't speak them fluently. Grace, that means things flow. Um, but I have a thing that when I go to a country that's an international country, I like to learn to speak conversationally, mm -hmm. be able to greet myself. Hello, my name is, excuse me, please, thank you. So I don't learn any language fluently. Like when I went to um, Tanzania, I never forget going in this room and this guy comes out and says, Jumbo! And I said, <laughs> Uhali Ghani. I see, see Jumbo. And the guy says, you know, like, hello. And mm -hmm. I'm like saying, how are you? Fine. And the gentleman that was sitting next to me was another athlete. And he turned around and looked at the guy and says, well, how are you? <laughs> and he knew about going on this trip like six months out, only knew like two weeks out. Mm -hmm. And he really jumped on that guy. I felt bad for him, but <laughs> my thing is, if I'm going to go to an international country, I don't want to be the ignorant American. So I try to learn a little bit of the language. Mm -hmm. Even when I went to Abu Dhabi, I remember every morning I got Kefa Halik, Bikayat Shukran, they would say Bikayat Shukran, or they'll say Kefa Halik, means hello, how are you? I'm fine, Bikayat Shukran. And I would be able to speak a little bit. And you just open the eyes up to the world when you do that because they look at you with a vague way of this is an American. But when somebody goes out there and takes the time to learn a little bit of their language, that makes the conversation more and it makes it inviting. Like you took the time to learn my language. And that's normally what they, that's what they don't expect. Mm -hmm. So you give them the unexpected. Oh, and most open their eyes and mine. Most definitely. Yeah, my stepdad's from uh, Istanbul. So, you know, I mean, I don't speak a lot of it, but I, I did, you know, I have, I can say hello and some, just like a couple other ones, but it, but it makes me grateful knowing that, you know, at least I took the time to, like you said, kind of learn at least some of it. So, you know, so, but, um, so, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, let me, let me ask this question first. I'm sorry. Um, so how did your friendship with Nora Mason come about? And could you tell us about how, what you have gained from this friendship? 
Nora Mason and I, way back, I think it was in 1986, they had a local office, uh, like a tort, sort of like our state is big. Mm -hmm. So they just had the state office down in Norristown, which is still is today. Ever since 1980, when I would go down there on a Greyhound bus and volunteer, still there, only a different place. They moved a couple weeks later and they were in this place and they're still in the same office where Nora and a friend named uh, Ann Edwards, two ladies, I guess they went to school together. They decided to have a regional office. So it was like 26 miles from my town. I get on the bus and go up there and volunteer. And that's how I met Nora and this other friend who worked at this office. And we just became good friends. And one time I was going to a camp and I wanted to go to camp so bad and I didn't have a way. So somebody got in contact and Nora said she would take me to camp. So she came to the projects in New York. <laughs> camp. <laughs> My mom was a little ticked because I was leaving for a week. She thought, oh, well, you're going to camp. You're going to come back at the end of the week, aren't you? I was like, uh, no. <laughs> uh, she said, well, how are you getting there? I hope you don't go. And I was like, well, I already signed up and this lady's going to pick me up. She comes from Harrisburg. And I, my mom was not happy. <laughs> but then finally Nora comes. I said, oh, she's here. And I had all my stuff packed up. And I knew my mom was on these because she didn't want Loretta to leave because mm -hmm. she did in projects and it was, you know, on the West End. And, and I was like, well, you got Lisa here and you got, you know, Debbie's down the street and Van, Van's down the street. Why don't you just ask one of them to stay or go to their houses, you know, like, so finally Nora picked me up and she, she did talk very nice to Nora and we went for a week and Nora gave me this headset. At, like you could hear, you put batteries in it. You can hear the radio. Mm -hmm. I still have it to this day. And that's <laughs> Me and Nora connected. Nora still still tells a story that, man, you ride for three or four hours and I didn't get too many messages in. <laughs> <laughs> I talked the whole way there. So I I can get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you you, you your uh, friendship uh, has developed to a, you know, where you're part of her fam part of her family and stuff, right? You spend time with her family. Yep, seeing her through Mary's babies. Those babies are growing up now, and they're young men, and they're my boys. They're still my babies. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have babies to make them your babies. You just all you have to do is just love them. Yeah, mm -hmm. No matter how old they get, they're still a part of me. Well, most definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I met Norm um during the 50th at a leadership conference, and, and I thought she was, you know most of the, the nicest person, you know, you'll ever meet. So I'm glad you guys, you know, it had an ongoing, I'm glad you guys had that ongoing. I've been very, very blessed with the people that I have in my life. And even throughout the year, some of them are not here anymore. Dana McFarland's not here. Eunice is not here. Mm -hmm. Just to men mention people, you know, people ask God for many things, material things, but I, I don't try to ask for things. I try to thank God for the people that I have in my life. That's all you can ask for, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like I wake up every morning and I know he does too, is that, you know, just being grateful that I have another day that I can, you know, be alive and do whatever. So, exactly. you know, so, so that's the best you can ask. So, or outside, of um, outside of Special Olympics, what are some of your favorite things you like to do? I like to exercise, go to the gym that type of thing. I've always been into fitness. Um, it's funny, like how I'll go to the gym and I see them doing these new exercises and they call them burpees. I said, oh, they're nothing but squat thrusts. And they'll look at me, what do you mean a squat thrust? I said, that's exactly what you're doing. That was a squat thrust in the 60s. That thing you're doing there, that's just an isometric. Mm -hmm. So just to meet up with people and go to the gym who have likeness, but I also like to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And of course, ever since that day with Eunice and volunteering for her son, I like to volunteer. I couldn't do it for the last two years, but I'm hoping to get back to our local uh, 
office in my city to get people to out to vote or put things together but I also like to make preemie hats for hospitals. And oh, yeah. I like to do the knockers for the women who lose their breasts. Being mm -hmm. a woman myself, I, I wouldn't want to go through that. So I, I like to do a lot of volunteer work. I used to volunteer at Flight 93, planting trees and doing brochures. So I like to give back in my own way. Mm -hmm. Everybody oh, thinks you have to give back with money. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Everyone on this earth can give back, even if it's just a voice to talk to a lady down the street that might be elderly and sitting by herself, to spend a half an hour or 10 minutes talking to that neighbor, mm -hmm. the joy that brings to that person. Everyone. Oh, most definitely. Way. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, we, you know, you volunteer, what, what, you volunteer at our local police station, and that's his way of giving back. See, right now, yeah. I've been, I've been doing, um, working on keys, sorting keys and doing the numbers and the letters. And um, I've been doing it for like six weeks now, you know, um, and I do that Wednesday and Thursday from um, one to three, and I'm almost done. But he, but it's like he goes up and he'll ask them, you know, what can I do to help? And, you know, just like you said, you know, it's not even the monetary, you know, thing. It's just helping your friend, you know, friendly neighbor or whoever, you know. So and whatever they need help with, that's what I'm, that's what I'm there for. Whatever they, they don't have time to, but if they, if they don't have time to, to get it done, I'll be sure that it gets done because that's, that's, that, that's what I'm helping them out and it's a less headaches. Yeah. A lot of keys. <laughs> oh, I got the key project. Yeah, the so. uh, looking you know because I had I have a um, magnifying glass and I use that, so I've got to write down the neat the uh, the numbers. The numbers. numbers. Yes. Yeah. And it's yeah. hard because there's at least I think eighty to one hundred keys. <laughs> but I'm almost done. Yeah. Yeah. And I, sorting, but yeah. So. so. So, well, Laura, what is maybe one thing that you think you could tell people about yourself that maybe you, that might, maybe nobody knows about you, so? I don't know. A lot of people <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I have this quirky thing and everybody is quirky. You don't think about it, but I have to laugh because I tell my friends I don't eat bananas on Tuesday. <laughs> And one time I was at this camp and I was setting the table. It was my day on a Tuesday and I put bananas at everybody's place and none at mine. And somebody says, well, Loretta, you forgot to put a banana down for yourself. I said, I don't eat bananas on Tuesdays. <laughs> so I like to, you know, have something quirky like that. And mm -hmm. I don't eat bananas on Tuesdays. Right. It's always good to have something, you know, maybe that, you know, and it might, quirky is the right word, but, you know, sometimes, you know, out of the ordinary is what I call it, you know, so that way, that's what kind of makes you different from people, you know, so. That's what makes you unique. There you go. Unique. Yeah, yeah that's the. That's, that's the word you're looking for. Yeah. 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 So. And uh, my friend always laughs at me because like, if I get something and it's, like really frilly, I'm not into the frilly thing. And then I'll say, ah, oh, that's too ritzy ditzy for me. And she said to me last week, oh, you know the hen, she just loves to put her knitting in a plastic bag, not a ritzy ditzy bag. <laughs> oh, I understand that. So, well, before we leave, I need to ask you one additional question. Um, since you've been around Special Olympics so long, I mean, what are maybe one or two things that you'd like to see in the future, you know, with our movement, the way that we're going now? What I'd like to see in the future with our movement right now is that every school around this globe would have a unified sports program or a unified banner program, because not only do we promote sport, but we promote inclusion for the whole school environment but I also like to see Special Olympics be known just as much as the Olympics and be respected for what Special Olympics is, that we're not the Paralympics, that we're Special Olympics, and that we have people with intellectual disability who can also jump their highest, be their fastest, or be their strongest. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think I like too the fact that I we all at least I try to. Uh, I always live my life the way you know um, the oath says. You know the, the one we take. So and it's nice. I and I think we're one of the if not the only place I do like the fact that even if you don't win, you know everybody sees ourselves as a winner, and you know everybody gets something out of it. You know it's even if you don't. You're a winner when you step on to that play. You're never, yeah. you're never you're never a loser. You're always a winner, whether you come in first or last. And that, that's something that, that I've carried for the past 42 years because it's like, you know, yeah, it, it, you know, it's like when I, I just had my powerlifting um, tournament and I came in, um, I got two browns and, and a fourth, but I also, but I did a, a, 190, a 195 in the um, deadlift and that was a personal best and I was happy with it, so. I mean, yeah, I look at it for the opportunity. Because... Yeah, and you know, it's like you, you know, it's like so. I didn't get gold, so but but I did a personal best, and I'm happy with that. And you did the best you could. So. Exactly. I'm not gonna. I look at it differently that my mother, because of the color of her skin, couldn't do these sports. And one mm -hmm. night, I sat at the end of her bed about two o'clock in the morning. I would talk to her, and she says, "Loretta, I hope you appreciate what you have." She says, because all those things that you're doing, the good Lord has blessed you to do them. I didn't have those opportunities. Mm -hmm. She couldn't walk on a tennis court and right. hit those balls, but she could only go on that tennis court to pick them up for the other people who played. Mm -hmm. So did you ever get a chance to do powerlifting or, or that's not your sport? I used to work out with weights, big, pretty big heavyweights back before Special Olympics ever had powerlifting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did martial arts, started martial arts in 1971. I started Special Olympics in 1970, yeah. and then I boxed, I even boxed. A lot of people don't know I boxed. Mm -hmm. And um, it was before Title IX, yeah. women that have the same rights. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, they have women boxers. Yeah. Actually, the big thing that's coming on the market is wrestling. My brother was a huge wrestler, and yeah. I used to wrestle with him. Mm -hmm. But girls weren't allowed to do that so now i have all these opportunities mm -hmm. and females and people with intellectual disabilities look at the young man chris nevich i think his name is that did this ultra what you call triathlon the iron, yeah the iron man, iron man. Yeah. yeah he didn't do the initial one in hawaii he might have but he's done one and to be able to do that to have that opportunity that's why i don't look at I look at sport differently yeah. than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I look at it that my mother, the generation before me, because of the color of the skin, didn't have that opportunity. That I had that opportunity. Right. That nowadays, all of us have the opportunity, mm -hmm. not only to play the sport, to be able to participate in the sport, but also take that opportunity and branch it out to be ourselves and use our voices. And Special Olympics provides more than just medals in sport. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and to that point, too, it's like, you know, before we used to be, you know, told that we need to be in group homes or institutions and hidden away. So, you know, that's what's nice, too, is that, we, you know, we don't have to, uh, have to do that anymore. So, you know, well, it's still, still a lot of societies. They still do that. And that's what we're trying to get them away from. Yeah. That oh, exactly. Value. Institutions are for people who committed crime to me. That's just basically a jail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Group homes are good because if they didn't have group homes, where would we put our people? Exactly. They definitely don't belong in nursing homes. Right, right. So, exactly. Good for some, but not for all. Yep. Yeah. So, we have our choices. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. So, go ahead. Thank okay. you so much. Um, thank you so much, Loretta, for um, joining us today. We, we really enjoyed talking to you. You are such a inspiration to everyone in the outside of Special Olympics. So, so, and so that wraps up another episode of Amazing Individuals. We hope you enjoyed our show. Uh, please remember to subscribe to our channel for more great episodes. Before we end today, Lisa and I would like to remind everyone to make sure to get their COVID vaccine as well as their boosters. If you have not already done so. You are not just doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for the whole world. We hope everyone will stay healthy and safe 
And remember that people with intellectual disabilities can accomplish whatever they want with the right supports. So thank you again, Loretta, for joining thank us today. So, yeah.